Hi, and welcome to Bookable Space, the audio literary salon. Author of Remembered, I'm your host, Yvonne Battlefelton. I'm a writer, host, presenter, academic, and a reader. I love being read to. In each podcast episode, a writer will read to us and answer three questions. We might talk about how they developed the characters, the sense of place, why they wrote the book, something they learned through research, and more. Ultimately, through each episode, I hope to get to know each author a little more, and I hope that you do too. Each episode is about 30 minutes. You'll find the author's bio and a bit about the book below the episode. Thanks for joining in. Today, we're joined by Cortia Newland. Cortia will be reading from and talking about A River Called Time. Wonderful. So thanks so much for joining us today and for being our guest on Bookable Space Audio Literary Salon. Thanks for coming. Oh, thank you. I'm really excited about this one. Yeah. Oh, lovely. So we jump right in. Yeah, sure. So, you know, I'm dying to ask, where did the idea for A River Called Time come from? Yeah, um, it's kind of, I can always remember this because it's one of the most explosive um, inspirational events that have happened in my entire life, which was that I actually had an out-of-body experience. And I've I've described this a few times in in the interviews for the book, in the press that I was doing for the book. But yeah, I had an actual out-of-body experience and it was really vivid. I mean, I realised when I had that, that I almost had out-of-body experiences my whole entire life but I didn't know what was going on and and like I'd always like woke myself up at the point where in the book when it's about Marcus can't breathe and he can't see and all of those things I'd always fight it and I'd wake myself up and sometimes I mean it still happens to me now but I always fight it I can't I mean this is unconscious I don't mean to if I had if I was really thinking about it I'd try and get it back and do it again but I can't help what happens to me so but this time I actually I remember thinking to myself, I'm just not going to fight this. I'm just going to relax. And when I relaxed, that's when it all happened. And uh, this was about the time, the period of time where the scholar had been published. I had just moved out of my mum's house. I was living in a small house just around the corner from where my mum lived and, and where I'd grown up. I was still in my own area. I was in this like men's, uh, it wasn't a hostel. It was like men's rented accommodation where we all had a room each and we shared the same kitchen and bathroom. I was in this place, and, uh, yeah, it happened. Another weird thing about this, and I can't really talk about this because this is going to be the subject of my next book, but um, I was overlooking the place where a really traumatic traumatic event had happened to me, where I lived. I'd actually overlooked this place. I could look out the window. I could look at the place where this thing had happened to me. So I don't know if that had any bearing on why it happened there but 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 now it's only now i've realized and put the two things together which is weird in of itself i never thought about that before but yeah i had this out of body experience and um i always say the first thing i thought when i came back to myself because I, I i saw an apparition like i saw myself lying down on the bed i was above my body all this stuff happened like it is in the book and uh when i came back to myself i said to myself i said like Was that an out-of-body experience? That was the first thing I thought. Wow, I wonder, because it felt like, you know, I was looking down on my own body, so what else could it be? And then the second thing would be, that would be really cool to write about. That was literally (laughs) my first two books. I will never forget. (laughs) Not, oh, no, is everything okay? No, yeah, it was like, wow, was that an out-of-body experience? Wow, I've got to write about that. (laughs) And so from then I started, so that was 1997. Then I started to try and think about ways that I could co- incorporate astral projection. Uh, at the time, I wasn't really correlating it to African cosmology, but I knew there was some correlation, but I hadn't made that connection yet. And as I researched into it more, I started thinking about that. And over a period of from 1997 to about, I would say, 2000, 2001, I slowly began to put all the different pieces together that made the book. Uh, and it was more than an idea. It was a premise. It was characters. It was a world. It was all of these things by that time. 
Wow. And have you had that experience? I know you might be thinking, wow, I know she said three questions and this one <laughs> is yet another question. Mm -hmm. But I feel like, um, you know, grammatically, this is just a comma, sure. not a complete yeah. new question. Ooh. But so have, <laughs> have you had like similar experiences after the one that you decided to kind of um, to be to just, you know, go through? Yeah. Yeah. No, it never happened like that before. But I have had the whole um sleep narcolepsy feeling of like, you know, not being able to see, not being able to breathe, you know, feeling like something's on my chest, you know. Um, what's really interesting is, is, is like I found all of this literature and, and art that have been um, created in honour of that experience. There was a wealth of things in the, you know, whether it's paintings, whether it was literature, um, not much fiction, but there was, there was, there was a couple of things, but not really that much. But in terms of nonfiction, in terms of art, in terms of people talking about this thing, it was kind of everywhere. And I realised what a universal experience it was. And that was another reason why I decided to write it, because it felt like this is something that loads of people go through that, that no one talks about, which I found really strange. Like, why not? Why don't people not talk about this? And, and I, I realised it was it was cultural. Like in the UK, people don't talk about it a lot. But when I spoke to people, I spoke to someone who was... Um, of Arabic heritage, and he said, yeah, yeah, in our culture, we say that the devil's trying to steal your breath and stuff. We say it's a demon, you know? So there's all these different interpretations of that experience, you know? Wow. So that is a wonderful segue into, can you give us a bit of a reading, please? Yeah, so um, there's a lot that takes place in this book, and it's a really complicated book I found <laughs> to... to, to um, <laughs> summarize yeah but i'm just gonna say that my lead character through this experience has found he can travel to different parallel versions of himself uh he can tra travel to different parallel times he moves sideways through time and uh he started off in one place as one type of person who's a journalist that um reports on things that's happening in his area, like riots and things like that. And he reports like fake news about these things. And in the second itineration, and he's got, he's not spiritual in the slightest, but it's just this thing that happens yeah. to him. In the second itineration, he's kind of like a guru. who's the leader of like, a kind of religious cult group that's, that, that works for the poor people in this particular area. And so he's a completely different person. And I'll just read a section of him coming to in this place. And slowly piecing together. Well, no, not slowly piecing together. Sorry, that's wrong. Him him just coming to as this person, as this other person. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, you guys will read it as this is just like the beginning of a book in a sense. But it's actually yeah. midway through the book, 150 pages in. And he's been someone else throughout the whole uh, first section of the book. Bright, steady awakening. He lay in the soft lit room, blinking at the ceiling, relishing cotton against his back. He didn't want to move or disrupt the feel of air through his lungs, the rumble of his heart, the pulse of blood flow, all signs of common existence. Every intricate working of his body's interaction with the outer world was experienced and understood with utter clarity. He took deep breaths, inhaling the last until it became painful, opened his eyes to the allocation, that low ceiling, those close walls. Light supplied by scattered candles, a dance of flames causing an illusion of rapid animation. He sat up, blanket falling into his lap along with something hard that rolled to his feet. He reached out, picking it up. The rough shard of a rose quartz crystal, worn by his clutch. He put it on the pod side for safety. There was a window light opening on his right, devoid of glass, a kitchenette beyond. He made out lumps and bumps of furniture, a solitary window that looked onto the barely decipherable street. A memory teetered on the edge of his conscious, consciousness as he tensed and he tried to recall words that he'd been told. By whom? He couldn't remember. He threw away the blanket. Cold raised his skin into minuscule bumps. He was naked. A pile of clothes on a chair. He stood and fell back into the sleeper, his full, weak legs another surprise. It took several pain rats attempts to stand upright, holding the wall to keep balance. Even when he let go, started to walk as if attempted to find balance against a stilted, rocking tide, one hand remained outstretched in case he fell. Though it proved difficult, 
He straightened, still leant against nearby objects. A simple pair of dark cotton trousers and a plain shirt lay folded on the chair. He slipped them on, feeling comfort, familiar warmth. There was a wardrobe at the foot of the pod. He limped to it, opening doors to see jeans and jumpers, shirts and suits. A number of women's skirts and dresses, t-shirts, pairs of jeans. Marcus smiled, holding them to the candlelight, sniffing fabric in an attempt to catch a trace of her. Maybe he wasn't fooling himself. Maybe he could smell a whiff of perfume, a lingering echo. Pleased, he put them down. The pod room was too small for a pod side cabinet. The pod itself had a cot like frame on either side that ended halfway between the head and foot. The frame provided enough room for candles, a man's watch, a single metal key that brought a rush of nostalgia, its retracted knife and a sprinkling of brown dust beside a random pyramid of tobacco. He picked up the key, holding it to his eye and turning it from end to end. He imagined the small box and smiled at the thought of its contents. Marcus fingered the dust, hesitant, lifting fingers to his nostrils, savouring the smell. Piaro, the sleeping drug. That's five minutes, is it? Wow. Um, I don't even know. It's such a gripping read. It's, you know, one thing I find, you do so much with tension and description. And I find that you always do such a wonderful job of like putting us right into a scene and making us feel like no matter what world we're in, no matter what, when or where we are, that we we get a sense that we've, we've been there and also that we belong. Do you know what I mean? Thank you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Yeah, no, I've, I've, I've read a few reviews that were like, you know, saying there was like kind of too much description, but I feel like, you know, I like to, re- when I read things, I like to really be immersed, you know, and they said the same thing about Lord of the Rings. And I was like, what? Huh? That didn't feel that way to me. Like, I was, I was in it. You know what I mean, I was, everything he was writing, I was living and feeling and stuff. And I didn't I ever, and I was young. I read Lord of the Rings when I was like, I was about eight or nine or something when I read Lord of the Rings and it just completely gripped me. And I didn't understand when people started saying there was too much description. I was like, what? Well, you know, I don't know um, if this is the, t- because this is, you know, recorded my audio confession. I um I skimmed through um, Lord of the Rings. Yeah. My son was probably like, uh, my older son was probably like eight. No, he was younger mm-hmm. because he couldn't read at the time. So he yeah. was probably like four or five. Yeah. And he was like, he wanted to read like, the Lord of the Rings, which meant that I had to read it. Yeah. And so, um, like with him and to him, um, and I would be reading it like, oh my goodness, it was so like, um, yeah. something about the book and I felt like we had a complicated relationship. <laughs> and then I was like, I would be reading it and I felt like I'd read it for a half hour and still be on page one. And then I was like, wait a minute, he can't read. So like, <laughs> like I reminded myself and I started like with reckless abandon, just like flipping like a page or two or three. Yeah, yeah. Next thing you know, I'm like halfway through the book, just like fling, fling, fling. And I'm like, and the end. And it was like, but I didn't yeah. feel like I wanted to do that with yours. I felt like I wanted to, um, I was immersed. I, I don't I know. I don't know. It was like, it felt welcoming. Like you was like, okay, um, so this is what you see and this is how it feels and this is how it smells and this is how, and it was like, I could be in that world and feel welcomed in it and feel like you were guiding me along and not feel like it was just like, um, what's this? What's, I don't know. It felt like you, you trusted the reader. Yeah, completely. Yeah. And then you brought us along with it. So, you know, thank yeah. you for that. I uh, really appreciate that. Cause I mean, that's what I was going for. I think I was, uh, I always write pared down usually, you know, I'm usually quite like, you know, spare, like with Cosmo is completely, you know, it's you know, a different style completely. But I thought with this one, I really just wanted to take my time and, you know, be patient and just not try and rush, you know, and just because I was trying to build a world. I wanted it to feel like really immersive and, you know, and warm and those things and just like saturate you. So I'm glad it worked for you. Yeah. 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 Definitely did. And speaking of Cosmo, where did the idea for that book come mm-hmm. from? Mm-hmm. I don't know because it's stories it's a kind of slightly different in a way I had the idea I know I definitely had the idea for a project as, the project as a whole I think I'd written two or three short stories that were science fiction or speculative fiction or whatever uh different stories than I'd written before and before I realized that I was you know I was starting to put together a collection you know so I think mm. I wrote Scarecrow I think Scarecrow was one, one of the first and then I had ideas for others, 
trying to think what came, what the early ones were. I think Dark Matters was an early story as well. Mm. And there was a few others that I think weren't really successful. So I ended up not putting them in. But I start, I found myself writing these things. And then, I don't know, I I, I just found myself reading um, The Ark of Bones, Henry Dumas. And, you know, and, and just reading short stories, collections, science fiction collections, and knowing, okay, I think I want to do that. And, and trying to emulate that kind of old traditional feel of, of, of sto- sci-fi sto- storytelling. I didn't want it to feel like a, a modern collection. I wanted it to feel old, actually. I love that. Oh, I do love that. And with that in mind, could we have another reading, please? Yeah, sure. So uh, I will now do further along in Marcus's journey as a guru. Um, he's just had a meeting with his um, his group, his religious group. They're called the Outsiders. And uh, they're just discussing. They're kind of like they 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 look after the the area. They kind of take care of the politics and they make sure that the rubbish is taken away. It's called the poor quarter where they live, and it's not serviced by the the the, the government or the powers that be. You know, they kind of take care of it themselves. So everything is down to them. The policing, medicine, uh, religious well being, and mental well being. Uh, the bins. You know, I mean, like where the rubbish is taken away and stuff like that. Everything's down to them. And so they've just had a meeting talking about this stuff. And this is just uh, Marcus and his best friend, who's actually the leader. Um, and they're, they're just talking about politics and stuff, like just and having a smoke, basically. <laughs> <laughs> the high street was desolate with abandoned buildings, the shop windows blank, cold glass. Broken doors and bent metal shutters lay smoke blackened, prone to sculptures. The street was mostly empty, only residues of past life. Husk of roasted planting, cassava and potato chip wrappers, tiny remnants of bone to betray what had once been. The lights were on, dim to sallow beige. At the opposite end of the street behind the closed barricade was the corpse, suited for combat, staring down anyone who dared to venture out of the quarter or prospect towers. Residents hurried past, heads zipped, shoulders hunched against silent threat moving with the quick purpose of night creatures, expecting the worst. The men stood alone beneath the awning at Safati's tech repair store. Window signs screamed sale beside scattered offers of discounts. A pale blue e-lamp shone in one corner of the window, indicating that the store was open for business to residents who knew what the signal meant. Fully masked, heavily armed corporation soldiers formed a line of 50 or more. With supporting vehicles and machinery, they stood in row after impenetrable row, still as winter trees. Sharp-edged drones hovered like evil fort above, a horizontal buzz of motion and blue-bottle wine. These autonomous machines were equipped with 2-2 bullets and HD digital recording equipment. No mics. A security precaution, in case the courts were recorded saying anything that could be hacked and transmitted out of the zone perhaps even out of inner city. How they enforced their will on on camera was of no concern. Ayazan prepared a tobacco splint, licking paper. He kept his sights on the courts best as he could, even with his head ducked. One quick movement and he was up, returning their mechanical stare. It was wise to see what they did, or might do. Hands in pockets, Marcus also watched. Brother, I'm with you. Aizan continued, between lighting the splint and emitting smoke. Scented caramel rose. He blew the fiery tip. News sites, VS bloggers, news drones, even writers and poets. You saw the Hogan piece, right? Very few stand to support us. Most agree our lives are worthless, so I totally get what you're saying. Then why shut me down in the circle? He kept his voice light, at low volume, back resting against glass, muscles worn by lamp glow. It was also wise to take precautions against being overheard in case former protocols had been reformed overnight. When you get the plans, we also need to identify where the people who write those articles live and persuade them to stop, one way or another. I can do that. Marcus watched, alert for the next question. How long? 
shrugging, trying a stray chocolate wrapper. Let me see. I'm not certain for sure. I'll know when I've made the jump. Good. Just let me know as soon as you can. And keep this between us, okay? Don't even tell Chili. They're all over the quarter. I wouldn't even speak too much in Temple until we find out how many bugs we've got. I put fire on it. He found eight or so in chambers, which means he probably missed a lot more. Got you. I then passed him the splint. It was hot, smouldering. Marcus put it to his lips, inhaling, eyes on the barricade. The masked corpse were like the corrupted auras of vengeful spirits, the most negative aspects of the plane, only more dangerous. What should we do about residents using sleepers and medis? Sylvain wasn't the only addict. It's rife. I know. I then examined the end of one lock, let it fall. We can't force them to stay offline. They're unable to keep disconnected even when they see the consequences. Those machines have a greater hold than we thought. Yes, and they're stupid. Misguided, I'd say, as and grinned, his boyish expression filled with genuine humour. But you're always more honest than me. A few quick puffs before he passed the splint back. Azan's eyebrows raised in thanks. Let them. Either we'll win by example or we won't. If we try to impose our beliefs, they could turn. We'll lose. Right. Azan spat at his feet repeatedly. The courts bristled, Mars sangled their way. Drones rose higher, the buzzing angrier. Many camera snouts pointed at them, whirring. What are you doing? Bit of tobacco. Yeah, well, don't, don't make your shit roll and get us killed. They swapped glances, laughing. Oh, on that note, I've been thinking. We should be wary about giving residents unequivocal cross-pantheon support. Sending condolences is one thing. We must, of course, particularly when they're outsiders. What you did, attending ceremonies, taking part in rituals, grumbling, a fitful shake of the head. I'm not sure. Not sure at all. I just think it there. Wow. Wow. So I was going to ask you about both books, but I think I'm going to focus just on for this one for my last question, yeah. which um, also has a conjunction or two. Mm. So um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's rich, it's intriguing, engaging, filled with tension. Mm. Um, this politics, engaging characters, it's just vivid setting, everything. What sort of research goes into writing this book? And What's one interesting thing that you found out that didn't make it into the book? Uh, there was loads of research. I did research over a 20 year period and I have a whole like shelf of books that were with my research books just for this book. Uh, more research than I've ever done before. And um, I researched everything. I, I researched architecture uh, because that is actually a building called the Ark. And it's a huge 10 mile building that exists in the middle of what is for us in a city London uh, in this in this uh, parallel world because this takes place in an alternate world in a in a city London has been obliterated it doesn't exist and in the middle is a huge building uh, meant to house people who've been affected by radiation and it's like you know f- uh, four or five stories uh, high and different levels of people live in those four or five stories and they live inside all the time. And these guys are inside that building. So I did a um, lot of like architectural stuff. I, I researched um, radiation. Um, I researched um, obviously religions, um, religions in antiquity. Uh, I researched a lot of African cosmology, uh, the chakras, astral projection, um, Physics, a lot of physics uh, research I did, trying to find the correlations and parallels. It just went on and on. And one book would lead me to another book, uh, a lot of African <laughs> spirituality. I read a book called African Religions and uh, Philosophies by John S. Matibi, and that was just, like, really helpful just to find out wow. what people had been doing before Christianity came. Um, but one, the one thing I found out that... Um, I don't know, it didn't make it into this book. That's a hard one. I know the one thing I, I found out that I didn't make enough of in the book was okay. the fact that uh, some flowers can absorb radiation and they used a lot to, they plant a lot of sunflowers in places where there's been like, you know, a, a, an accident, like a kind of like nuclear accident or something like that. And they oh because of their ability to absorb radiation. And I said that there were some flowers 
planted in this in a city region. As you take a train to go into the arc, you pass they, they would pass fields of some sunflowers. But I did it so subtly that people probably wouldn't pick up on the fact that that's what their use was. And so I think maybe I didn't use that properly. I think that. But most things I ended up using. There is one thing I know didn't go in there that I can't actually remember. But that's one thing that just it was kind of more of an aside. They just rode past it on the train, but I didn't say what what it was there for. Yeah, in some place. But you know what? There's going to be some scientist that's going to be like, yeah, yeah. because they're going to know exactly why those sunflowers are there, yeah. and they're going to really be like, you know what? He did this for me. Like you know. Wow. So I think and if there are times when you like reach out. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> So I absolutely, I love that. I love that there's some somewhere, there's something in it for people who know it. Yeah. And for those of us who don't know it, it won't, it won't be like, oh, but you know what, when we watch the film of it yeah. and the movie gets, the, the music gets really kind of eerie and we pass, like, you know, <laughs> we see them passing rows and rows of sunflowers. Yeah. We may not know why, like the direct correlation, but we're going to know that something, there's something, you know, is a mess. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of the book is like that. I, I really wanted to write it for people who can pick up on all of the, the subtleties that are involved in the book. And yeah, I don't explain a lot, you know, I really don't. And I, you know, I explain some things because I had to, but if I didn't have to explain it, I would just write it. And so I, I, I can understand why for some people it might be like, what is going on? But I think, you know, for people who get those clues and stuff and understand it or are curious and say, oh, why were there sunflowers or something like that? It, it's, it will reward you because everything is there with the intention of, of, of meaning something. It, like, there's no description in there. Going back to the people saying there's too much description. There's no description that doesn't have some bearing on the story or the character or the environment, you know? Oh, I love that. Mm. I love that it, it's each each has a tool or a role to play. Oh, totally. And it's up to us kind of as readers and detectives and, you know, and all those things that we come to a book and being curious yeah, yeah. to look at. Well, so we know that this does something. What is it doing? Yeah. I, and so it's writing, you know. I know in um Oh God! The, the, there's there's a short story about a reunion. You know the reunion short story. Do you know that one? Um, and I've forgotten the, the name of the writer. But in reunion, it's a short story about a boy who meets his father. He says, "That's when I met my. This is when I met my father for the last time, or something like that." And there's a uh, oh, wow. he's drinking. He's drinking this drink. Is a cocktail that has um, onion in it. You know, it's like it's like onion. It's a particular drink. And when in, in classes, when I always used to teach it, you know, uh, I, I used to say, yeah, like, do you know what that that drink is and what that drink symbolizes? And they were like, no. And then we looked it up and it's a drink, it's a cocktail that has an onion in it. And because it had an onion in it, you couldn't tell that the person had been drinking. And that's the sign yeah. of the alcoholic, you know what I mean? And so I've always written in that way. He never told you what it was, the guy was drinking that for. He just gave him this drink. And when you research it, you're like, oh, that's the kind of drink, alcoholic's drink. Because you could go to the office and you smell of onions rather than, alcohol so. then you know yeah. i love that i love that that's a story that you use because i always use reversible yeah when i'm talking yeah. to students about like um like short stories yeah. and yeah. uh and <laughs> oh, oh sorry reversible sorry i was thinking of yeah yours my story sorry <laughs> I was like, well yeah i love reversible yeah <laughs> I was thinking of, um, well, why shouldn't you love it? You wrote it. No, I was thinking of Bullet in the Brain. When you said that, I had a link to Bullet in the Brain. So I was thinking, yeah, I love Bullet in the Brain. No, <laughs> yes, sorry. That's amazing. But thank you. That's so amazing. Yeah, I love my story. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I would say something like that. <laughs> I'd be like, I, I didn't know. What do you think about this story you wrote? <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, that's really brilliant. <laughs> Exactly. No, thank you. No, I really appreciate that as well because that's what I was trying to, those kind of details, that's what I was trying to put into that story and about, about learning from Bullet in the Brain and learning from uh, Reunion, you know, that the how, you know, being that specific, even if people don't pick up on it, just you know, everything meaning something is, is a good way to go because then I, I think it can then stand the test of time, you know, when you do those things and it, it demands the story's demanding close reading and, and attention being paid to them. I love that. And speaking of standing the test of time, could we have one more reading from? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course. And so uh, this one is just a, like they, they go to Azan's home. So the guy that Marcus was just talking to, they go to his house, him and his wife, 
go to his house and they're just in the house and again this is quite rich with description but it's all in service of kind of trying to say what type of man Aizan is you know the kind of character that he is although they've been friends since they met on either side of a grainy nursery school sandpit the wheat sun leaden and high above their matted heads Marcus found as much of Aizan's ways as mysterious as a stranger's he possessed the quality of a person who achieved blank spaces in their life without trying, moments and experiences no one, even those closest to him, could penetrate. Marcus calls those, called those events subconscious voids. Most of the time his old friend didn't know how he behaved, he was positive of that. The sheer epitome of being, he just was. If they walked, Aizan would disappear without warning, only to re- reappear at their destination as if nothing had happened. Or if he arrived at a gathering talking loud and fast with excitement, he'd bring someone with him he'd known for months, even though he'd never mentioned their name. He'd speak in depth on subjects he'd previously never shown interest in, trigonometry or the omega nature of walls, or even show adeptness in skills Marcus had never seen in practice or discuss. Over time, especially in the claustrophobic blocks of inner city, others put the trait down to Yaisan's blessing as an old soul something that Marcus had long considered to be true. And still, ever since childhood, he harboured a secret belief of his own. Ayazan was magic personified. The most obvious manifestation of those black hole spaces was his belongings. His allocation was a mirror double of Chili's and Marcus's home, yet while theirs was untidy despite being relatively free of all essentials, Ayazan's was packed to the ceiling with things. Every possible space was filled with some object or another, and still the impossible was made real. The allocation was tidy, almost like an inner city show home. Chili would often comment on it when they left the flat, hunchbacked to avoid being overheard by neighbourhood gossips, speaking in whispers that verged from jealousy. They didn't understand how he managed it. And it wasn't even that the things he obtained were shoved or squeezed into spaces where their inexact positions left them exposed, awkward, obscene. Wherever they'd stood, they'd been stood, laid or hung, there was barely a sliver of room between the place he'd found for an item and the item beside it. Simply put, Aizan's belongings always looked as though they belonged. Perched on the sofa, holding earthenware mugs of peppermint tea, starting at the sun roar of Aizan's generator booting online, Marcus pretended that he couldn't see Chili sat beside him, head swiveling, eyes roaming the room in search of additional objects. He attempted not to follow her gaze. Aizen constantly attained, obtained new people and items. Marcus had no idea where he got them from or even how. They materialised from nowhere in a regular burst like teleportation. Lovers, work products or pieces of art appeared in an eye blink. Walls were filled with indigenous paintings, masks and sculptures composed of bright astral colours and representing cultures from all over the world. Some depictions were traditional more rural. The man fishing a calm lake, red sun falling behind him, or the steppe pyramids of Chechen Itza bathed in tall green trees. A brown leather bound kebra nagast. The narrow eyed contemplative stairs of Bulan masks crafted from wood, metal, and even 3D baker light hung beside Venetian cat side masks and others, and other streets, black and white, possibly a badger. A varied forest of sculptures, lion shells and bookcases. A woman bent drawing a calabash of water, a bare-chested man carrying his toddler son on broad, muscled shoulders, an Indian elephant adorned with a headdress, trunk raised, two Chinese symbols sculpted side by side, the Mandarin for tranquility, as I once said. There were Comitian Anks, a cartouche with from, with from head to toe, a squiggled line, a feather, a bracelet with two bees placed in its centre, a half-risen sun and an eyeless bird, a metallic eight-pointed lotus of the soul, the inspiration for the outside at logo, sat atop a bookshelf. Amongst them there were sketch drawings of all manner of chakras and unfinished canvas of beautiful of a beautiful woman Marcus didn't know, and Ayaza never spoke of. Whenever he was asked, he would smile and say, Beautiful spirit, golden. He never mentioned her name. It drove Chili crazy. Bookshelves were packed so tight, Marcus wondered how he freed the volumes to read. Shelves were somehow built into walls and placed around the room, which gave the confined allocation a smaller, darker feel, 
although the final evening beam of lights managed to penetrate a lone central window. The coffee table was stacked with a neat pile of board games, a ware, chess, Chinese checkers, a slim and weathered dominoes box. Balancing a two-full mug, pleased with a job well done, Aizan entered the living area. In his other hand, he carried a plate full of biscuits. He rested both on the coffee table beside the keber and the gas, huffed, surveyed their manner, smiled. Okay, now we can talk. Oh, that was absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for such engaged readings. I realize I hold my breath when people read to me. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, and that's a good sign. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for your generosity, for reading to us. And where can we find the books? Do you have like a favorite place um, for people to buy them? I mean, I would say like, you know, the any local bookstores, any independent bookstores there are that are local to you. If you can get it from there or order it from there, that would be great. I mean, if not, you know, there's Waterstones, you know, there's you know, Amazon. I don't, I don't, you know, people say, oh, don't say the A word. Like that, you know, but I'm kind of like, look, you know, I appreciate, you know, the fact that they're a huge company and that they, they, you know, do things that people don't always agree with, but they also stock all of loads of people's books, man, which is like, yeah. you know, something that not a lot of other companies can do. So, you know, I look at it from that point of view too. But yeah, any way you can get them, which feels right to you, is fine with me. Oh, that's wonderful. Great answer. Thank you so much. And um, thank you to everyone for listening, for buying the book, for talking about it and sharing it with your friends. And thank you for joining us. Bye. Thanks for listening to Bookable Space. If you don't already have the book and want to read more, buy it, borrow it from your local library, read it, and if you enjoy it, review it if you haven't already. I hope you'll join us for the next episode of Bookable Space, the audio literary salon with your host, Yvonne Battlefelton. Follow me on Twitter at YBattlefelton, on Instagram on Why I Write Battlefelton for pictures, interview insights, and more.